So we're going to continue this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We will be covering verses 10 through 17, but I want to start with a question. Do you think there are people in churches today that are following men instead of following God? You know, I find it odd in light of the passage that we are about to read that there are movements within Christianity. There are entire denominations, in fact, that are named after men. But is Christ divided? Well, let's start reading 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Paul writes, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So the thing that I want to focus there in verse 10 is the pleading of the Apostle Paul. He pleads with the church in the name of the Lord that they all speak the same thing, which is a reference to doctrine or what they believe. You see, what they believed is what brought them together in the first place. The church at Corinth was to be united in doctrine, but as is often the case, it was their behavior that was causing the problems. And unfortunately, the church had divided up into factions. Now, why were they doing this? Did it have anything to do with doctrine or what they believed? Uh, apparently not. Most of the division came from people getting upset or people arguing over people and personalities and behavior. And Paul here, he's essentially saying, you know, it's not about these men. It's not about Paul. It's not about Cephas. It's not about these men. It's about the message. It's about Christ. It is about the gospel. So we are united. Why? Based on what we believe. That's what unites us. We are unified around the truth. We are not unified around men. Uh, favoring one church leader over another, arguing about which one is the greatest. You remember when Jesus had to do that? He had to rebuke his disciples because they were all arguing amongst themselves about which one was the greatest. Who is greater, Peter or Paul? Now, you might have an opinion about that. Maybe they had an opinion. You might have an opinion over who was greater, but you know what? It is a dumb thing to divide over. The Christian church has unity when we elevate the truth, not when we elevate a teacher of the truth. Uh, the only man we can elevate is who? Yeah, the only man we elevate is Christ himself. Uh, but that's not what most people do. Uh, men love to elevate other men. And this is a real problem in the realm of of religion, even within certain sects of Christianity, where a man is exalted to such a high level where it basically turns into a personality cult. Have you, you're familiar with this term, the cult of personality or a personality cult? Uh, there are people out there that are following men instead of following Christ. And if that man, if that preacher, if that religious leader were to say, drop dead tomorrow, a lot of people would fall away completely. Why? Because they were not really committed to the truth. They really weren't committed to Christ or the gospel. Their allegiance was to a man, to a movement, uh, to a cause, but not to Christ. Now, I don't think it was quite that bad in the church at Corinth. But obviously there were divisions in the church and it was sort of like arguing about who their favorite preacher was. That's what it looks like based on who their favorite leader was. Some said, I am of Luther. 
I am of Calvin, or I am of Wesley, or I am of Billy Graham. Okay, that's not quite what they said, but do you understand the point? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Some of those were great men, you know. But did John Calvin die for you? Were you baptized in the name of Billy Graham? If you, if you were, you need to be rebaptized. I'm just, <laughs> just saying. Now, there's two points I want to uh, make about this. So let me, first of all, say it is actually okay to follow a man in this sense. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Or in the King James Version, what does it say? Follow me just as I also follow Christ. So that is legitimate to follow a man in that sense, as he follows Christ. So that's legitimate, the Bible says so. Because a leader is exactly that. He's a leader. People follow the leader. There's nothing wrong about that necessarily. A, a pastor is a shepherd. The shepherd shepherds the sheep. We just need to remember one thing. Who's the true shepherd? Who's the good shepherd? Who is the true head of the church? So number one, make sure you are converted to the Lord and not some church leader. Now you say, well, who on earth would do such a thing? Who would be converted to a pastor or to a church leader? Well, it happens all the time. It happens all the time in every church, nearly every church, when a pastor retires or passes away or steps down or leaves, there are always people who stop going to church at that moment. It's, it's almost like their attitude is, if he's not there, I'm not going to be there. Well, I thought you were coming to worship the Lord. God is still here. <laughs> Isn't that what you were coming for, to worship God? Weren't you converted to Christ and not the pastor. So number one, make sure you are converted to Christ and not a church leader. I don't think we have anything to worry about there. I don't think any of you are converted to me. Okay. I, I don't have that big of an ego to think that's what you're doing, but it happens. It, it definitely happens. So number one, make sure you're converted to Christ and not a church leader. Number two, if you are going to follow a man as he follows Christ, that is fine, but don't exalt that man. Don't put that man on a pedestal. That's really, really dangerous to put someone on a pedestal and just exalt them because when you realize they're not perfect, which they're not, uh, that can cause people some problems. So don't uh, put a man on a pedestal and don't divide or cause division based on personality. If we're going to divide over something, we're going to divide over some essential issue. That someone's denying the deity of Christ. Someone's denying the virgin birth. There's a church out there that's saying the Bible isn't the word of God. Those are the things that we would divide over. So if you're going to divide over something, make sure it's something important. Don't divide over my guy's better than your guy. But again, it's the type of thing that happens. Now, going back to what we said at the beginning, Paul reminds the church to all speak the same thing. And what he is basically saying is, you all need to believe the same teachings. You all need to believe, preach, and teach the same doctrine. That's what's really important. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> so, what keeps us together? What we believe. The doctrine. Now someone could say, but pastor, doesn't doctrine divide? Isn't Paul saying, let there be no divisions among you? How can he stress doctrine and the same breath uh, say you can't be divided when doctrine is so divisive? And this is what people say, and I've heard this, you probably heard this. They will say doctrine divides, Christ unites. Doctrine divides, but love unifies. You know, that sounds really great. It sounds really good, but here's the thing. That's a slogan. It's not a Bible verse. Slogans are not authoritative. Bible verses are. But this is the mistake that many people make. And yeah, division can be bad, but sometimes division is necessary. I mean, Jesus was a divisive figure, wasn't he? I mean, they crucified him. 
Jesus was a divisive figure, but that doesn't make him bad. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control. We're seeing a lot of that these days. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such men, the Bible says, Turn away. Now skip down to verse 10. Paul says, but you have carefully followed my what? My doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, and perseverance. So in the last days, we see that perilous times will come. There will be people who don't care about God's truth. They don't obey his commandments, and yet they have what? A form. Of godliness. What does it mean to have a form of godliness? Uh, basically, that means they have the outward appearance of religion or the outward appearance of godliness. They may even claim the name of Christ, but they don't really love Christ. They may claim the name of Christ, but they deny the power. Now, what is the power? Well, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. What is the power that they are denying? These religious people in the last days who have a form of godliness but deny its power. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is what? The power of God. What's the power? The power is the message of of the cross. The power is the gospel. The gospel, Amen. Paul says in Romans 1, is the power of God unto salvation. That's the power which brings about a truly changed heart, a changed mind, and it brings eternal life. Unfortunately, though, today, the message of the cross is being ignored. Instead of exalting the biblical Christ, his cross, his gospel, instead of exalting those things, what do people do? They oftentimes exalt men. They exalt man's wisdom. And look at what the Bible says in verse 19. You want to exalt men? You want to exalt man's wisdom? The Lord has something to say about that. The Lord says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So are we to unify for unity's sake? Absolutely not. If the gospel is being denied, ignored, the gospel is being tampered with, we cannot unify with those who do that. However, we can have unity within the body of Christ, the true body of Christ. We can have unity within the local church. But we need to believe sound doctrine. We need to agree on certainly the essentials. Now, again, Paul is saying in verse 10 that believers are to speak the same thing. And just as there shouldn't have been any division in the church of Corinth, there really shouldn't have been. There shouldn't be division in the church today. Now, is there division? I'm not talking about in this church because we have a, a very good unity in this church. But is there division in Christianity today? Like, well, that's a rhetorical question. Of course there is. So Paul pleads with them to all speak the same thing, to be joined together in the same mind. And in the next chapter, he explains that. He says, we have the mind of Christ. So again, the divisions here that Paul speaks of were not so much divisions over doctrine, about what they believed. It was about those who preached the doctrine. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household. We don't know too much about who that is, but we know they contacted the apostles. That there are, he says, contentions among you. So uh, we see it seems to be a, a fight about who's the best preacher, who's the best church leader, who's my uh, 
Who's my guy? You know, I'm with this guy. I'm with that guy, that type of a thing. I remember I attended a, uh, an event years ago. You don't know any of these people, so don't try to speculate who I'm talking about, okay? I attended an event where the associate pastor was there, but the head pastor was not there. And the people made a few comments where it was clear the associate pastor, he was their guy. They said, if you want something done, you go to him. And they made other comments where it was clear that the associate pastor, he was their man. Now, maybe they didn't dislike the head pastor, um, but they were open about the fact that they liked the associate pastor better. Now, think about it. The head pastor, he might have had some of his people too, right? And what does that type of thing turn into? Say, well, oh, he's preaching next week? I, I ain't even going to go. <laughs> you know, that, that type of a thing. It's just one thing leads to another to another. Now, listen, I don't think there's anything wrong with having personal preferences. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, the people in Corinth... They may have thought, some of them might have thought, Apollos was a better preacher than Paul. Maybe he was. Maybe he was. But that's not the type of thing that we should air out publicly, right? Personal opinions are fine, but sometimes we need to keep some of these things personal, as in a personal opinion. Keep it to yourself. Certainly don't go uh, public with it. But obviously that was not the case. Uh, people in Corinth were getting into arguments over these types of things. And it got so bad, they had to reach out to the Apostle Paul. Now, why did they reach out to him? Well, he was the founder of the church. He was an apostle. Obviously, his word carried a lot of weight. Now, the divisions were broken up amongst four men, right? So you have Paul, Apollos, Peter, and then Christ. And Cephas is Aramaic for Peter. So these four men, Paul... Apollos, Peter, in Christ. Those who said, I am of Christ, you know, that's understandable. I mean, we are Christians, right? So to say, I am of Christ, I don't really think uh, that's a problem. You could understand that. If we're going to say we're of anyone, we would say we are of Christ. Uh, but those who said, I am of Paul, you might be able to consider these people the loyalists. Right? Paul was the one who founded the church. He probably won a lot of them to the Lord. They may have been loyal to Paul. And honestly, I can understand where they're coming from. But you don't want to take that type of thing too far. You don't want to start dividing or arguing about it. Uh, Apollos, the Bible says in Acts 18, 24, Scripture says he was eloquent and mighty in the scriptures. So apparently Apollos was the best preacher. That's the way it looks. And that's probably why some people gravitated towards him. Peter, on the other hand, you know, the, the Jewish members of the church may have gravitated towards Peter. And Peter walked with Christ. He was uh, one of the apostles that the gospels mentions the most. So people might've been impressed uh, with Peter. But you see the response in verse 13. Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Obviously, these are rhetorical questions. It's like, this is a really dumb thing to be arguing about, you guys. Don't you realize that? I already mentioned when Jesus rebuked his disciples about arguing who's going to be the greatest. You remember that other time where James and John Ask Jesus, can we sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in the kingdom? Did that promote unity within that group? No, it really made the, the other 10 disciples angry. When you think about it, though, if Jesus had said, yes, James, yes, John, you can sit one at my right, one at my left, what would they have done? I guarantee you they would have argued who gets the right hand because we don't want the left. So they would have argued about that. You just know they would have. So it didn't promote unity. And what's behind all of this? Why do people argue about this stuff? I think, well, there's a lot we could say, but I think the root cause is pride. You know, we're better than they are, or I'm better, I deserve it. Uh, I think pride is the issue. Our group is better than your group. You know, it's like in high school, right? You had the cliques. There's one group over here, and then there's another clique, and they don't like each other. 
Why don't they like each other? Well, there's not really any good reason. It's just us versus them. That's the way people are. And unfortunately, that's the way they were uh, in, this, in this church. Uh, us versus them mentality when they should have been united. I mean, it's, it's not even like they said, well, the church at Corinth is better than the church at Philippi. It wasn't even that. They were divided amongst themselves. But I like how Paul handles it. Paul is very wise. He's a very wise man. We should take some advice from him. He knows that if he comes down on those who are of Peter, that's probably not going to go over too well. And maybe some of them remember when Paul rebuked Peter, and that might not have helped. So he doesn't do that. Instead, Paul addresses who? Well, he addresses his own followers, the people who say, I am of Paul. And what does he say? Did Paul die for your sins? And what's the implication? Well, no, and neither did Peter, and neither did Apollos. I think they would have got the message. Verse 14, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Besides, I don't know whether I baptized any other. In verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize. Now, why was Paul thankful that he had only baptized a few people? Well, number one, if he had baptized more, then the problem would have been worse. Number two, some people might have been starting to accuse Paul of starting his own little following, saying that he baptized in his own name, which he never did. And then number three, uh, the big issue that's being addressed here is that the Christian church, the church at Corinth, and you could argue about this term, but it was starting, okay, at least the seeds were being planted of it being turned into a, for lack of a better term, a personality cult, like I had mentioned at the beginning of the sermon. That's apparently what was starting to happen. And believers, we need to be on guard against this. Peter was just a man. He's a great man, but he's just a man. Paul was a great man, but he's just a man. Apollos was just a man. But you know what? People just can't help themselves. They need someone to idolize. They need someone to exalt. You know, and the Jews, they experienced the same type of thing. A few examples. Moses. Moses was revered by the Jewish people, right? The Hebrews, they looked to Moses. Moses was... I don't want to say he was like a God to them, but you remember when Moses died, what happened? It says the Lord buried Moses. That's very strange. The Lord buried him. I don't think you see another example of that. Why did that happen? I think one of the reasons was the Lord knew if Moses was buried by the people over there, what would the people do? They would go to his tomb, build a shrine, and venerate, or venerate is just another word for worship, they would turn it into a worship site. They wouldn't be able to let go. And then there was Abraham. Uh, the Jews, this is what they did. We are of Abraham. You know, we are children of Abraham. Instead of trusting in the Lord, the Jews, many of them trusted in their bloodline. You know, we're special. We are of Abraham. Uh, this was one of the very first things that John the Baptist rebuked. You remember what he said? Don't think to say to yourself that you have Abraham as your father. The Lord can raise up children of Abraham from these stones, he said. Do you realize, and speaking of John the Baptist and this whole concept of a personality cult, you know that John the Baptist was beheaded, right? Do you realize there are churches... And some churches in America do this, but it's more common in Europe and in the Middle East. Do you realize there are churches that claim to have relics? They claim, there have been churches that have claimed to possess the skull of John the Baptist because he was beheaded. When John the Baptist pointed at the Pharisees, there are some churches that have claimed to have the finger bone of John the Baptist. And why, why would that even matter? Of course, these aren't his actual bones. It's almost certain they're not. Well, what's the big deal? Well, people come, they pay money 
they bow, they pray, and they venerate, or essentially they worship corpses. They worship bones. They worship relics. They worship blood-stained cloths and other morbid items. That's a personality cult. When you're worshiping someone's finger bone, <laughs> that's a personality cult. Do you realize, I don't think most people realize this, and I always say, check me out. You know, if I say something and you're not quite sure, check the facts. Do you realize that the Vatican has a video camera focused on the tomb of Pope John Paul II, and they live stream a shot of his coffin 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can go on the Vatican website and watch his coffin right now being live streamed. You say, that's weird. That is really weird. It's the cult of personality. That's what it is. And you know why Paul didn't want to be exalted? You know why he didn't want Peter to be exalted or Apollos? Because he knew that's the type of thing that this leads to. Where men are worshipped. Men are venerated. What does that do? It takes away from the worship of the Lord. The Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that he was making disciples of Christ, not disciples of Paul. That's why he hardly baptized anybody. And along those same lines, I remember I saw an interview several years ago, Charles Stanley. Most of you, does anyone not know who Charles Stanley is? <clears throat> okay, so everyone knows who he is. Uh, Charles Stanley, I saw in an interview, he was talking about how he doesn't baptize people at his church. You know, he's the head pastor and he doesn't baptize anybody. He actually refuses to baptize people. And I remember when I heard him say that in the interview, it sort of rubbed me the wrong way at first. I'm thinking, well, you're the pastor. They look to you and you don't baptize them. And it sort of didn't sit right. But then he started to explain it and I started thinking about it. And yeah, he, he made some good points. Well, why didn't Charles Stanley or why doesn't he baptize people? Is he afraid to get wet? You know, is that the problem? He is a Baptist. You know, none of the sprinkling, none of the pouring. You got to get in the water and dunk people. Well, that's not it. He knows that this can lead to what? Someone in his church. Who were you baptized by? Oh, remember Pastor uh, Jones who was here five years? Oh, yeah. Well, I was baptized by Charles Stanley. I was baptized by Dr. Stanley. You know, that's the way it goes. Imagine if someone came here. And they wanted to join our church. And you got to give your testimony. And we ask you, well, have you been baptized? Well, yes, I was baptized by Billy Graham. Now, if somebody told me that, I don't think I would believe them because I've never heard that Billy Graham uh, baptized people. But let's say he actually did baptize the person and they came here and they wanted to become a member. You know, people would be impressed by that. Hey, we got to get this guy on the deacon board, right? Maybe he should be the pastor. He has like a double anointing because he was baptized by Billy Graham. You know, people are like that. You know, even though the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons, man is a respecter of persons. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So the Corinthian church, they started having problems when they started looking to man instead of God. Instead of unifying around what they believed, they tried to unite around certain men, and that only brought contention and division. The fact is, there is only one Lord of the church, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ is not divided. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. There is none other who died for us. There is no other man who is worthy of all of our praise. And on this subject of unity in the church, Lord, I pray that you would preserve the unity that we have. I thank you for the unity that this church has. Let us not take it for granted. Rather, help us to uh, maintain and even increase that unity. Maybe 
uh, one thing as we think of the church at Corinth. They were arguing and dividing. Lord, if we're ever tempted to say something negative about another person, uh, let each one of us determine before we do that, we'll pray for that person. And I think if we do that, that would solve most of the issues. Father, I, I thank you again and bring us to the knowledge, all of us, to the knowledge of the Son of God, that unity that the scripture talks about. Protect your people throughout the week and beyond. We pray it all in Jesus' name.